Welcome everybody to this series and edition of Optimize Ed. I'm your host, my name is Michael Roviello. I'm here today with professional athlete, swimmer, and also a good friend of mine, Roland Schumann. So thanks everybody for showing up and viewing us. Uh, please make sure to hit subscribe and follow all of our podcasts, videos, and information on our YouTube channel. Uh, Roland Schumann is born in South Africa. He's a professional swimmer. He's an Olympic champion, three Olympic medals, a gold, a silver, and a bronze, which were all accomplished in 2004 Olympics in Athens. Uh, he's a 10-time world record holder. He held the fastest 50-meter freestyle. Uh, he was the first man to break the 21-second 50-meter freestyle. He also is the first man to ever break the 23-second butterfly, and that's also 50 meters. Uh, welcome to the show, Roland. Thanks and, for having uh, me, brother. Really appreciate appreciate you having having you here uh, to talk about your life, your swim career, um, your habits, your discipline, your mindset, and all the things that took you from uh, basically an entry level swimmer uh, to um, the best uh, in the world. And uh, we'll also talk about uh, the upcoming Olympics, which has obviously been postponed due to COVID-19. Uh, we'll talk about the future uh, for Roland and also uh, what's next, you know, after swimming. So, awesome. Cool. But good. We would love to, to find out how you actually got into swimming. Um, you know, did it just start as something recreational? Uh, did you have some sort of, um, maybe some pressure? Sometimes parents are like really into a specific sport, so sometimes they'll kind of direct you uh, in a certain fashion. How, how did you get into professional swimming, or at least swimming at an early age? Right. I think just starting off, we, you know, South Africa, I mean, we're very, very fortunate that we have a lot of swimming pools. Uh, growing up, we did, and I think so many parents wanted to get their kids you know, just water safe more than anything else. So sure. it originally started when I was, you know, three, four years of age, just to kind of get me adapted to being in the water, being safe, being able to do everything I need to in the event of an emergency. When I was six, started a couple, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe even a month of, of formal training with a team. At that point in time, I'd just been doing every sport under the sun. I played cricket, tennis, soccer, track and field, field hockey. I just pretty much did everything and you know, had contemplated swimming. It was the middle of winter there, so it was at an indoor pool. It really, you know, just from a me what memory serves me, it just stank of, of just chlorine. And, and there was nothing worse to me than staring at a black line for an hour or two hours a day. And after, you know, I think, you know, what I remember, about a month, I decided that was it. I didn't want to be involved in swimming in that capacity anymore. I, I loved playing. That's when you were a kid. And that's when I was a kid. Yeah, so going to the ocean, uh, you know, going to the beach swimming in the waves was fun. Um, going to a friend's pool and playing around, that was fun to me. But you know, going in and doing something organized in terms of swimming when I'd been play for so long, it just you know, it really wasn't what I wanted to do at that point in time. So it really got to the point where you know, when I was in my second year of high school, in South Africa, our high school system works a little bit different. Uh, School year starts in January, ends in December. Obviously, our seasons are flipped over into yeah. America because it's Southern Hemisphere. Yep. So we have summers then, obviously, from say September, somewhere October along through March, April. And it wasn't until you know I was you know, sort of the summer of my second year in high school that there was a really cute girl on the team. She was a grade below me. Um, saw her, you know sort of fancied her and mm. thought, well, what can I do to impress her? You know, I know she's on the swim team, so let me find, you know, let, let me start swimming. Maybe I can be a decent swimmer and impress her that way. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, by any means a conventional way into the sport. I think swimming kind of chose me in, in many ways, shapes or forms. Yeah, it sounds like that. But yeah, and it wasn't, I mean, being 13, 14 years of age, you know, it was kind of puppy love for us. I'm very, very thankful to her that it got me into the world of swimming. But after a couple of months, you know, her family got transferred to one of the coastal cities in South Africa. And there was just something about swimming that I loved, something that, that really stuck with me and something that I was passionate about. And, and for whatever reason, 
you know, many years later, I just wanted to see, you know, where I could go. Um, I had a couple of key friends that were involved in swimming as well, and you know, there was that sort of synergy between us, and you know, it was it was fun to to try and push myself to get to the next level and try and be better than they were. Seems like it opened up a lot of doors for you as well, uh, getting you to obviously transfer to the United States, which we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, but how were you in high school? Would you say you were kind of a middle ground swimmer or were you finding that you were just built for this sport and doing really well at a young age right off the bat? I think because I've been involved in sport for so long that my athleticism stood out and that helped me to a certain degree. But having started, you know, really six you know, to 10 years later than, than most people. That's right. I was really struggling with, with my technique, the fitness in the water. I mean, anybody that swims understands that it's not, if you're running fit, you're not necessarily swimming fit. You can be swimming fit and then be running fit, but there isn't generally a transfer. Exactly. Different type of conditioning. Absolutely. I mean, you know, as well, being a rescue swimmer, it's just kind of, you know, if you, if you haven't been really grown up swimming a while, it takes you a long time to, to get the technique component sorted out and, and that's sort of what took me a long time and uh, huge amounts of frustration and like I said one of my closest friends at the time I remember you know at that point in time you still have sleepovers and you go and hang out and he had a sort of a you know a metal you know board where he had everything put up and I remember walking in and seeing all these medals and I went back home to my mom and I just said I'm never going to win that many medals it just seemed almost insurmountable at that point in time because I I wasn't that great, and it was really frustrating. I feel like I, you know, I played for my state team in soccer. I played for my state team in cricket. I was a top-ranked tennis player in the country. Wow! So it was, you know, this wasn't coming easy, and there in of was of it was a challenge and something that I really enjoyed, but also a huge level of frustration in not being able to be the best at it. And it wasn't really until my, you know, my fourth year of high school that I, I really started excelling, that I started, you know, beating a lot of people around me. It was towards the end of my fourth year in, in high school that I went and raced in, uh, in Taiwan. It was an international high school tournament and we had a South African high school team that went and my state team that went and I didn't represent South Africa until, you know, until my senior year of high school. But at that point in time it was, you know, I went across, I won the 50 freestyle, I won the 100 freestyle. I, still have photos of it just really cool experience to be there and to you know to all of a sudden I've been beating so many people in South Africa and now to go to the international stage and all of a sudden you know win when it kind of wasn't expected and it was it was tough for me because I knew I deserved to be on the South African team that had gone but I was just thankful in many ways that I had the opportunity to go and represent my state team so it was the state team Yes. But there was also a South African team that would compete globally right. in Taiwan. And how was the Taiwan, Taiwanese? Yeah. How were they like in, in the world of swimming? Were they were considered pretty disciplined, pretty good? Not, not in the greatest scheme of things. Some talented youngsters, a couple of talented swimmers. Much, I mean, not, South Africa is way more, you know, we don't have a, a huge swimming culture in, in terms of depth, but we have had significant standouts at points. And that was, you know, I just got, kind of followed suit with that. So it wasn't like the United States or Australia or England where you've had significant depth in that sport for years and years and years. Sure. You know, that, that's one thing I didn't have in South Africa growing up was a sort of a male figurehead or a male role model that I could say, oh, well, I wanted to be like a Michael Phelps. You know, a lot of Americans grow up and they're like, I want to be like a Michael Phelps. Or yeah, of course. Whatever it was. So to me, I, in many ways, I had to be a pioneer for myself. There were international swimmers that I looked up to and thought, man, I like to emulate that at a point in time, but there wasn't a South African that I could look up to and be like, man, it's been done. They've been able to go to the US and they've been able to be a world beater or an Olympic gold medalist or whatever it is. So there've been several, you know, there was one guy that helped recruit me to the University of Arizona and he kind of was a distance swimmer at that point in time. So he was the best in a sense. So for me to join him in Arizona to see the level of success that he'd had there sort of was was really motivating and a level of you know I can go to America and be accomplished or become accomplished and that was a key I mean uh, so you're living in South Africa and you start to look at the globe of like where are the countries that are most competitive 
So it's kind of like all eyes on the United States. That's a pretty much the place to be. Yeah, U.S. Australia have typically had the strongest contingents of teams that they've sent to to every Olympics, which you know, makes sense because they were kind of going at it toe to toe, right? In the Brazilian Summer Olympics, right? That's yeah, that. and obviously China as well, Russia as well. They've had long histories of being of having really successful teams, but for the longest time, it really was the Australian team or the Australian men's team and the U.S. men's team that went. Obviously, I'm just considering more the men's teams at this point because that's what my I was trying to emulate and try to do. So, of course. you know, it wasn't necessary for him. The Russians were doing, or the British were doing. Interesting. So then, how did you make that transition from, you know, your state team being recognized in South Africa and getting on, you know, like a United States collegiate kind of level? Mm -hmm. Like, where did that bridge uh, occur? Yeah, it was sort of, in my fourth year of high school, towards the end, my, my coach at the time, he was my high school team coach as well as my club coach, um, he just said to me, you know, because I was continuing to focus on, on all the sports, you know, not only was I swimming, but I was doing field hockey, rugby, cricket, tennis, several other sports, and he just said to me, if, if you, I believe you can go to the United States, I believe you can get a scholarship and you can go study there, I don't know how good you're going to be. I don't know if you're going to be able to go to the Olympics or win a medal, but I believe the first step is to go overseas because I don't necessarily believe that we can give you everything you need here in South Africa. So at that point in time, he had me, you know, he suggested to me that I focus solely on swimming. And, you know, so you dropped the other sports? Reluctantly, but I liked that idea of going to the United States because I, I had a dream to represent South Africa internationally playing cricket. But the idea of living in America and coming to a collegiate or a college here and being part of collegiate sport was really, really enticing because I, you know, I'd been subscribing to Swimming World magazines and you know seeing what was being done in the U.S. and, and the camaraderie and team atmosphere that you know that I saw in the pages just seemed of like the kind of system that I wanted to get into. And then it wasn't until you know we had my the Commonwealth Games trials in April of of my senior year in high school and, and I qualified. I made the South Africa team in the 50 freestyle and 100 freestyle and with it came scholarship opportunities and you know, the one that I ended up taking was from the University of Arizona. It was a, you know, the best scholarship offer that I had at the best school with another South African and, and sort of that, that for me was kind of the full package. I had the opportunity to fly out to, to Tucson and I remember flying in and you know, flying over you know, the desert. from Chicago, and wow, Chicago is beautiful. And you start getting further and further south, and then you see the desert, and then you see nothing. A lot of nothing. A whole lot of nothing. I was just wondering, where am I going? Like, is this from the sunny beaches <laughs> of South Africa, and everyone has seen the Cape Town photos of crowded beaches to the desert of Tucson? And I was like, I'm going to hell because <laughs> this is kind of what hell looks like, right? Cacti and in the middle of the desert. And, you know, it was in June or May, so it was kind of leading into summer, already hot, you know, high 90s. I never really experienced that kind of heat before, and then that sort of dryness. So I landed jet lag, and you know, 17 years of age, and wondering where am I and what am I getting myself into? And you know, met the team, met the coaches, and just immediately get had this impression that I could do well here nice. and I'm going to thrive. And the team was amazing, and the coaches were amazing. It just felt like I belonged. Awesome. And I think that was the, you know, and You felt accepted right away. Absolutely. And I think that was key. I think there's, it's easy, a lot of athletes go on recruiting trips where they go for a weekend or a couple of days, and it's easy for a team to fake a level of authenticity. Oh, yeah, they put on the big show and go around, like the beautiful campus. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, being there for two weeks, I had the opportunity to see the best and the worst of some people, which was still great to me because it was, you know, training in this pool and in this atmosphere with, with other conscious people that were trying to achieve the exact same thing is something I'd never really had the opportunity to experience before and now all of a sudden I was there and I'm like, I'm done, yeah, I commit. What was the reputation like of University of Arizona when it came to swimming? Were they considered uh, like a competitive school in the sport, good all around? I mean, because ultimately Arizona has a good reputation for athletics. I mean, from Arizona State University to U of A, basketball, football, right. baseball, has been like really good wrestling that's come out of here. It's like a lot of good athletes in this state. And I'm not an Arizona native, but 
I've been living here since 2004 and I've really noticed that. So what was uh, University of Arizona uh, like at that time? Was there like a good chance to to really thrive there and, and be competitive? And I think so. I mean, going in, they were top 20 team in the NCAA, and, but going in and seeing the level of talent and the desire and how hard, it, it wasn't just, you know, some teams you go in, there's just a sense of mediocrity, and it doesn't have to happen to necessarily have to be a team. It can be a work environment. It can be a store. It's just general, of course, you know, a sense of, I'm okay with being okay. Yes. And that wasn't something that I ever aspired to be. I wanted to be the best, whatever that meant. Mm. You know, and so for me, it was important to go to a team where the coaches wanted to win the NCAAs. They wanted to place people on the podium at the Olympic Games. I didn't just want to go to a team that wanted to go to the conference and do, you know, and be top five in conference. That wasn't li living up to my level of expectation of, of myself or what I wanted to achieve, and I wanted to be really put into a program where they were going to be good or the, the desire was at least there to be able to be a top team in the nation and you know after I graduated they went on and both men and the woman won the NCAA championship the wow. same year which was you know, I felt like I helped build that you know I'd been there for 10 years living and training down in Tucson and with a team and it was really you know, I believe that all our groups were instrumental in helping them achieve that, which was really, really cool. Did you excel right away in college? Did you find that um, you being the outsider, you know, coming from South Africa, I would say the majority of your team most likely were Americans. Um, sometimes that gives you a little bit of advantage, like, right, when you're the outsider and, you know, you're kind of like maybe their special weapon. You know, they yeah. recruited you to come all the way, you know, from across the globe to the desert to represent their school and compete. Um, did you find yourself uh, uh, excelling like mm -hmm. right away, freshman, sophomore year, like doing well in all the, the necessary meets? Yeah, I had a, a really meteoric rise. I think the benefit in being foreign um, is that you really have to struggle to, to get to this level. I, I think a lot of Americans, uh, athletes, people in general, just have everything handed to them mm -hmm. on a silver platter. And there's just a level of expectation. They get to college and it's like, oh, well, I can just do X, Y, and Z and I'm going to be fine. For me, I just really had a, a hunger, a desire. You know, I, I was still trying to learn to get better. I wasn't taking anything for granted. I had chosen swimming. It, you know, it's not like I'd been doing it from the age of four or five and just was doing it out of, you know, just parents it, pushing yeah, you to it. Yeah. 100%. And I think what also counted in our favor was you know, coming in, arriving at school and starting in, in you know the spring semester most people had already been there for you know five six seven months by that time and and I was unheard of nobody knew who I was I came in NCAA championships of my uh, my freshman year I think I got second or third in the 50 freestyle I was the high point or the, myself and the other South African guy we were the two high point scorers for the University of Arizona nice um, that year again or swam the top time in the world in the 50 meter freestyle long course uh, my sophomore year came in got second in the 50 freestyles second in the 100 freestyle top eight in the 100 butterflies so it was immediately I was coming in making a difference and that was important to me uh, I, I wanted to be able to come into a team and, and, and help lead and yeah. contribute exactly right oh nice and you know at that level I mean you're already starting to think about the Olympics right because that's like the end that's like the end goal for right. our collegiate level swimming. I mean, that's like the, the Super Bowl, right, of, of that sport. And um, at what point did you start recognizing that there's a good possibility that you can be an Olympian mm -hmm. and like really make this a, a career? Because I would say most people like end their, you know, I would say their, their sports, you know, if they were good in high school, then they go to college and they play well in college. And a lot of times that the look like to get to the professional level is just, you know, it's so small. So a lot of times it ends there at college mm -hmm. and, you know, they choose a different career, maybe whatever they majored in. Um, um, so at what point did you start realizing, wow, this is potential for a, like mm -hmm. a lifelong career? Yeah, so I started school in um, January of 99, so that was my freshman year. And sophomore year was, 
you know, 2000 when, when I had my first Olympics. And I think I'd fought for so long to be good. And then all of a sudden I got to the college and I was really good. Nice. And I swam the, you know, I swam the top 50 freestyle time in the world. So I was ranked number one in the world going into the Olympics for the longest time. And I, with that came a huge level of arrogance. Mm. And, you know, the, you know, there was a huge fall. And because I remember going into, you know, with the comp compliance department at the University of Arizona, I was like, you know what, when I win gold, you know, not, not when I win gold, but there was, an, you know, there was a belief that I was going to win gold and, you know, I might need to go professional after that and what would that look like? And that wasn't the right attitude to adopt at that point in time. Um, a lot of it was, yeah. Young man. Young and dumb. Yeah. Very, very much so. And Could all relate. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and arrogance and very little humility in terms of that. And, and I think it's, I think it's bred from a confidence and a real, you know, it comes across as cockiness and arrogance. And, sure. and there is a level of that, of course. And determination. 100%. A lot of it is just, I have this innate belief in myself and what I can accomplish. And the way it's presented is obviously the arrogance and the cockiness. And I uh, went to the Olympics. Uh, I How got, old were you when I you was 20? You were 20 years Olympics. old when you went to the first Olympics, yes. representing South Africa, right. uh, but obviously compete, still competing and, and swimming for University of Arizona. Right. So how does that work? Like the swim meets kind of end for the collegiate level and then you start doing all this prep work for the Olympics? Yeah, so the... Because I don't, you know, you know, it's hard for me. You know, I've always watched the Olympics, uh, of course, just like everyone else and been fascinated with the beauty of it, the competitiveness, but how it necessarily works, like the machine of it has always been really confusing for me and, and, and how, like, people get accepted or train and, and what that looks like. So maybe you could share just a little bit of, how do you go from swimming for um, University of Arizona, you're a sophomore, you said at the time, right. you're in school, you're taking classes, you probably have little to no social life as my guess, um, training, right, morning, evening, swimming, you have all kinds of different swim meets, competing against other universities around the country. I know uh, you mentioned uh, before our Podcast that uh, Texas has like very very competitive schools and I'm sure California is pretty good as well. And then at what point do you start like becoming this Olympic candidate? Mm -hmm. So obviously different countries have different expectations and different requirements for for qualification. South Africa we always generally have our, our qualifying you know, meet in April, so the international season is largely seen as the summer. So. Collegiate preparation starts in September, end of August, when you get back from your major international meet. Got it. And then it's, you sort of have your fall season where you have competitions, but then the NCAAs is in March. So it always worked out really, really well for us. Being South Africans, we'd have to fly back to South Africa to compete at our, at our trials, whether it was a Commonwealth Games trials or the uh, Pan Pacific Games or the Olympics, whatever it might be, World Championships, we had to go back in April. So we'd always, you know, shave and rest for the NCAAs and then we'd fly directly to South Africa and, and go compete there. Different countries have different selection criteria. One of the things for us was we had to go back. So it was, you know, for me, that was the dream. I wanted to be an, an Olympian. I wanted to compete at the Olympics. I wanted to win the Olympics. That was my goal. Very focused you know, at that time. Very, very life. focused. Absolutely. So a lot of the a lot of the swimmers on the University of Arizona team and, and other teams were just okay being there. They just enjoyed it, being part of the swim team. Right. Maybe they felt inside that they didn't have what it takes to be. Yeah. Or or there was a level of of acceptance. I'm going to go to. I'll qualify for conference. Got it. And I know that's when my talent's going to end. And I never, I never thought there was. You know, it's like if somebody said to me, "I'm going to help you reach your potential." I don't want you to help me reach my potential because I want to. I don't ever want to reach my potential. I want it to be sky high, kind of thing. You know, it's, I've always believed that I could continue breaking barriers. It didn't matter who I was, where I was, what age I was. Well, that's key, and let's talk about that because I think that's what really separates people. I mean, a large majority of people watching this podcast have competed at some level of, you know, athletics, whether it was junior high school, high school, college level, but. How did you create this 
discipline or this determination at such a young age that you were seeing and projecting way beyond, um, you know, just the, like you said, uh, making conference or, or something of that nature, that determination. Where do you think that comes from? Is there any moment in your life at childhood or something that you can relate to that just gave you this, this drive? Uh, because it's not something that you really learn. It's not like you go to school and you, you learn how to create uh, drive for yourself or motivation. It's just really intrinsic. It's something that you have or you don't. Yeah, I think it was, it probably originated to a time where I didn't feel like I was enough mm. and had to prove myself and had to continue to prove myself and it eventually it became a routine and, and a, a desire and a sort of, my, you know, that my desire and my want to accomplishment and my determination sort of became the mask for my level of not being enough and I was just finding ways to be enough in my own eyes or the, the eyes of the people around me yes and it ended up being you know it's like okay well I wanted to be the best in the world but it was a decision I made it every single day when I woke up you know I you know in high school there were friends that were going out to parties on you know Friday nights and Saturday nights and that was never for me I just I knew what I wanted to accomplish and I made that decision over and over and over again. Every single morning I woke up. That's the hardest part right there. And that's the thing. Is so many people look into the future and it's like, oh, well, well, this goal, the thing is for the Olympics, they happen once every four years. So it's a sacrifice. You have to sacrifice essentially for four years or eight years to go to a single Olympics. It's not like you have the opportunity every single year or every few weeks. It's like I've got many friends that play on the PGA Tour and they play, you can choose between 10 or 30 tournaments a year and you have 30 opportunities to win yeah. every single year. The Olympics are very rare. No, very rare. And and that's the thing is like, I woke up every single morning and I made the decision that I was going to, you know, uh, I was going to think big. You know, I was going to believe in the impossible. And that was some sort of a motto of mine that I lived for a long time, believe in the impossible. It's like when I, you know, if I said to somebody as a kid, as a five-year-old, I'm going to be Spider-Man. I believe it. You know, it was like I was watching a video of, um, of one of my close friends. He's a little kid. He's a little kid. He's three years old. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to climb a wall like Spider-Man does. Mm -hmm. But you could not tell him he could not climb that wall he because he believed it. He believed it. And he was going to try it over and over and over and over again. And it didn't matter how many times he failed, he was going to try it over and over again. But yet as, kid, uh, as adults, if I were to say you... By the end of this year, I want to have a $10 billion corporation that I want to own or create. People are like, come on, man, that's yeah. crazy. You know that's not possible. Yeah. It's like we're conditioned to think small. Yeah, we are. You know, and that's the sad thing about the state we're in right now is whenever somebody thinks outside the box, oh, like, oh, oh, oh yeah. come, come back here, come yeah, back here. Yeah, have rocks thrown at them these days. Right. Yeah. How dare you think uh, outside the box or differently than the... You know, the big group and you know some belief is just so powerful it's so strong um, the power of belief you know I mean we can say it conceptually and I think we we understand yeah I really believe that but there's certain things in your life every single person in their life has something that's really strong uh, that really strong level of belief and um, I've been that way in, in certain areas and um, I think we don't pay en enough attention to that and it's um, it's really powerful medicine for sure so you have this this uh, this power of belief, of course, at a young age. But not only do you have the power of belief, um, you have really good discipline because you say no to the parties, which are hard to do, especially in college. Right? Think about it. You're uh, coming from South Africa. You're new to the country. You're an athlete. There. Beautiful women all over the University of Arizona. It's got a reputation for partying. I know a lot of the Arizona schools do. ASU surely does. Yeah. Um, and to not get caught up in that, which would be really you know easy to get caught up in, especially if you know you're just this star athlete and you're doing well and people know who you are and recognize you. Um, but to say no. To say no and to not go to the party because you know you'll be up late or you'll be hungover and then you're not going to be able to do well at 6 a.m. when you're hitting the pool. That's really uh, that's really special. Not a lot of people have that. Yeah, I think that's, you know, in South Africa the drinking age is 18. 
and amongst family members in South Africa, I could be five years old and I'd have a sip of beer. No big deal. No big deal. So by the time I got to college here, I had a level of understanding with what alcohol was, how it can make me feel, um, the good and the bad of it. Whereas my teammates, the people around me, the people my freshman year, sophomore year, first time they'd ever been away from home, first time they could really go crazy and drink as much as they want. And a lot of the parties centered around alcohol. And, and to me, that at this, that point in time just wasn't a big deal. So I didn't understand, I mean, trust me, I was like, on a Saturday night we could go out and, and party and that was sort of the night that I could go out and, and have fun and, and enjoy myself. But it wasn't like the, you know, the habitual drinking and the binge drinking and, and the, I'll be all, oh my gosh. No. That's an American thing, that's really true. If you look outside of the, you know, the borders of the United States, I mean, we just have that reputation for, you know, you're not allowed to do it, so it's mm-hmm. taboo. And then the minute you're allowed, it's like beer bongs and spring break and cakes. I mean, it's all fun. It can be all yeah. fun, but yeah, yeah it's all we, you get a little crazy. Um, but yeah, if you're drinking at the age of 18, it's no big deal. Right. You just are maybe a little bit more mature, a little bit more of an adult about it, and realize yeah. that it's has its fun, but it also creates a lot of havoc in your life too. Right, so exactly. that was good. You're able to make the decision not to participate. Uh, maybe lose out on some good fun nights and some good stories, uh, but ultimately you stay very focused, it sounds like, and on your path to getting to that day. So tell us a little bit about like what is it like for a 20-year-old to be accepted into the Olympics? What Olympics are we talking about? What was this was it? Sydney. This was in Sydney. Sydney Olympics. Very cool. Yeah, this so is your first time in Sydney first as well? Sydney. I remember, you know, first time I've been to Australia, uh, remember landing just going through the whole process of you know getting to the airport getting your own special channel to go through your own immigration uh, then taking a special bus to the Olympic Village awesome and that whole process of just remembering it being, felt great. oh my gosh it was a, I mean really the greatest experience you, you could ever experience so yeah I mean in high school and college I sacrificed opportunities to do that so is it really a sacrifice or is it a trade-off? You trade-off. Know, for me, it was always a trade-off. Yeah. It's like, okay, that well, sounds like a better deal. Right, 100%. <laughs> like, I want to go to the Olympics and win a gold medal. Yeah. Uh, do I want to wake up and have 10 hangovers versus win an Olympic gold medal? You know, the, to me, there was a priority. You know, I've set a certain level of importance on that versus the other things. And, you know, there was that continuous trade-off. Like, what is my decision today? I can slack off or I can work hard. You know, I make that decision every single day and go to the Olympics and you, you have that level of experience and excitement and you know, that really to me was the, the coolest thing about it. So going in I had this you know, level of expectation that I was going to win. I had the 100 freestyle which was not my greatest event. So they put, chose you, your team chose you, all right, we're putting Roland in in the 100 meter freestyle. Yeah, I qualified in the 100, qualified right. in the 50 at the trials, you have to mm-hmm. swim a certain time. So won the 100 freestyle at the trials. Nice. Uh, Finished second in the 50 freestyle at the trials, I believe, and then well, I might have won. I, I can't remember, that. but it was yeah, going in. You know, was expecting to win the 50 freestyle, and I made it through to the semifinals, 100 freestyle. Didn't make it through to the finals. Disappointed, but you know that wasn't what I was expecting to, or where I was expecting to excel. And then had the 50 freestyle, and you know the time that I went a year earlier to have me number one in the world, I couldn't reach that. Yeah. So you already had the number one freestyle in the world yeah. coming into your first Olympics. And it was the fastest time anybody had swum in four years. So people were talking about it. Right. Which is a great way to enter the Olympics. Yeah, without right? a doubt. Because you have that kind of added motivation, this added feeling of I am good, probably some added pressure too. Yeah. But it's probably nice to go into that. People are looking at you, people want to interview you, they want to you know, maybe take photos with you, find out what your preparation is. Mm-hmm. That's cool. That must have been a really neat experience. Yeah, it was a fun experience. Um, but yeah, 50 didn't go as well as expected, or I'd hoped. Um, made it through to the semifinals, didn't make it through to the finals. Uh, you know, that, re- that really was the toughest part for me. And then, you know, went out and had a whole, you know, really enjoyed the nightlife afterwards. And, but it was Sydney. more, yeah, it was more sort of, because of levels of frustration and levels of sadness as opposed to being able to enjoy that experience. But you in place. Right. You know, right. And that's the key. Right. All that work, you want either a bronze 
a silver yeah. or of course a gold. Exactly. I think you want gold and but you'll settle for second or third. Of course. If you're not getting top three, you you've wasted a year or you've Four wasted years. several years, yeah. you know. And that that to me was the you know, I went back to South Africa after that for a period of time and uh, you know, just I was broken down, I was beat up and I couldn't determine figure out why and went and had a blood test and I'd had mono. So wow. at the Olympics and afterwards I'd had mono, so that was you know, a little bit of consolation, like, okay, well, I went to the Olympics, I had mono. And you still did and well. And I still did well, you know, so that, that bodes well. There's still a level of frustration and sadness in that because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't able to win. And you know, it's like we said earlier, it's once every four years. You have to be the best in the world on that day, you know, and there's a lot, a lot can go right or a lot can go wrong in that period of time. And it was, yeah, it was tough. Who is like the team to beat, or maybe the swimmer to beat in the 2000 Olympics in Sydney? Who was like the, two American who guys? Who's the rock stars back then? Anthony Irvin and Gary Hall Jr. So Gary Hall Jr. grew up in Phoenix. Uh, he's a Phoenician. I lived here, trained here for years. Those two were, you know, myself, Anthony, Gary, um, and a Dutchman. We were the top four in the world at that point in time. So it was really between the four of us nice. as to who would potentially win. And actually, Gary and Anthony tied for gold. Wow. Yeah, so that was pretty cool for them. So they performed well, expected well. to perform well, and yeah. wind up performing yeah, well. Yeah, there has to be a level of expectation in there. You know, and expectation, is, it can be good or it can be bad. It depends on the scenario. It also makes for, like, good entertainment, right? When you start to, like, put pit people against right. each other, you know, these swimmers that stand out um, which is which is really cool I remember uh, you know, in Brazil they did a lot a good job of that sure. you know talking a lot about the, the American swimmers here and um, swimming is would you say it's the most popular or top three most popular sports in the top two track and field and swimming are in the summer about the Olympics. most popular yeah because yeah. it seems to get a lot of attention overall and the athletes that do well in those areas really stand out amongst uh, all the other applicants. I mean, you look at Michael Phelps, Usain Bolt, you know. Yeah, those are like the, the big names of 100%. the Olympians, you know, present day. I mean, you could look at some of the American, you know, female Michael soccer players, maybe from the, the women's team, uh, maybe softball years and years ago, but it really is track and field and swimming uh, that, that really get the most views on, on, on TV during that period of time. Got it. Yeah, you're right. This the the summer Olympics is uh, and volleyball. Yes, volleyball. Everybody loves beach volleyball. Everybody loves beach volleyball <laughs> too. So this is 2000. Uh, didn't end up uh, as well as you wanted it to be. Find out you have mono. You're back to South Africa. or You back to the states? I'm back to South Africa for a short period of time. Uh, just to hang out. Yeah, relax, just to hang out for relax. Family. Got, it. got back to the States and you know then you don't have too much time to you know wallow in, in your sorrow it, it really is about refocusing I think that's that's a good part about the collegiate setting is if you're a professional you know it maybe is once every four years or uh, once every two years for the world championships but college you're right back into we've got to work yeah, with you have other meets coming up other schools to compete with right. and you probably now are like pretty recognized amongst all the universities throughout the United States. Yeah, most point. people know that I'm, you know, of the top two, top three sprinters in the U.S. At, at any given time, and for me that's a good thing because I can contribute to my team and score points. I can contribute on relays. I'm still wanting the aspirations of you know winning a team title or winning an NCAA championship with you know for the 50 free or the 100 free or be a part of a relay that wins a, an NCAA championship. Um, so that was the next focus: is that get back to the states, start working hard again. It's like refocus, and I think that that's one of the, the key lessons is, you know, it's like becoming accustomed to. I don't like the word failure because there's so many negative connotations, but of course. you know, being accustomed to failure, and you know, f failure isn't you know isn't final. You know, so many of us are, are so scared to achieve our goals because we don't want to fail, but I think professional athletes are the best failures in the world that we can. You know, we can fail to succeed, fail to succeed, but we keep on pushing, finding ways to rework ourselves, revamp ourselves, uh, identifying areas that need growth. A yeah. lot of us are too scared of that. We don't want to get into the nitty gritty of what makes us, you know, unique or different or, 
you know, if we embark on opening a business and the business fails, we see that as a reflection of ourselves. Instead of being able to say, okay, well, why did it fail? Okay, did I invest it where I should have? No, I invested with some really shady characters and that probably wasn't the best bet. And, and really being able to compare, you know, figure out where I didn't excel. And I think the athletes are the best in the world at that. We can, there's accountability. We have coaches around us. Coaches, mentors, yeah. And you get an opportunity to compete and actually see where you size up. Like where, where am I, you know, in the broader things where in everyday life it's kind of hard to size up unless you're looking at maybe material things and how much money you made from that business or uh, how much money you have in the account or mm -hmm. something of that nature. But yeah, sports is very much like that. I appreciated that with my time in the U.S. Navy. Um, I have a background in swimming as well, nothing like a, a Roland here. But I went into the helicopter search and rescue program in uh, 1999. And our uh, Navy, U.S. Navy uh, helicopter search and rescue swimmer school is in Pensacola, Florida. And I remember getting there. Uh, my very first day after basic training, uh, getting ready to, 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 to class up is what they called it for SAR school or rescue swimmer school. And this was uh, the training where they lead everyone out. Where it's like, okay, you guys have all been elected to be here, but who actually deserves to be here? We're going to go through this process. We're going to get rid of all the people that can't compete at this level. And then we're going to train this group and they'll move on and to the fleet and actually do the job of a rescue swimmer. So uh, they, it was rescue swimmer candidate school and I never forget getting there and being with guys like you actually who were competitive swimmers in high school. Some guys had done some college level swimming. We had guys there from California who were lifeguards which is not an easy thing to do. Um, I was from Queens, New York who swam in the backyard above ground pools and went to the beach on occasion. So uh, I was pretty nervous. Um, but I learned really quick, uh, you know, what I had inside of me because I was put in a position to compete. Where I, my entire life I didn't really compete for anything. So once they put me in a position to compete, um, and I didn't think it was going to be a fair playing ground because these guys had years of, of uh, swimming experience and I had little to none, just all recreational. But the advantage that I had was we have to wear a, like a harness, we wear um, fins, we wear a snorkel, we wear a mask, we had lots of drag. Stuff that swimmers, you guys want no drag. No. You're not as used to drag. As possible. And yeah. you guys do a lot of pull as well, a lot of upper body uh, swimming, right? Because right. uh, the guys' backs were like big V-shaped backs, you know, long arms, uh, very tall. Um, and that was my advantage mm -hmm. because they were so used to swimming a certain way that I was able to just adapt to the right. way that the Navy instructors had taught us. So I was actually doing really well right away with all the drag. They had to change their stroke, they had to change yeah, old habits, and it actually worked out to my advantage, and I wound up doing well. Um, but that gave me the ability to, just to go back to where we were, the, the ability to compete. It's mm -hmm. like, oh wow, like, this is where I'm at, you know? I'm not as bad as I thought. You know, all those, these bad, negative things that we tell, tell ourselves, you know? Um, and that was really important for me at that stage of my life, because I didn't have any, good mentorship or anything like that and uh, until I got to the Navy and I started getting some really good mentors and uh, people that were around me who uh, built me up you yeah. know so I was like you were surrounded by coaches and people who believed in you and, and your teammates uh, all that which is it's just amazing for really any young person to, to have that I think that's really important for sure. to have that in your early 20s right your teenage years I, so. think, I think that's important I think in today's society, we're so afraid of of giving out medals. It's everybody gets a participation trophy, and I'm too scared to hold you accountable yeah. because I don't want to get into trouble. But I think you have to, or, or find an environment where that is capable of being done. Yeah. For you being a rescue swimmer, for me being on a collegiate team, wanting to achieve you know what we achieved, it's it's important to have those people around you, you know your teammates, your coaches, your family that 
can keep you accountable for what you decide you want to achieve. And I think that's part of why I got to be the best in the world was the fact that it wasn't, you know, and, and I found that changed significantly. You know, when I moved away from college or from the University of Arizona to, you know, overseas and then for a long period I was just kind of swimming on my own. And I was having to keep myself accountable. And I think I learned how to do that, but there's, you know, there's nothing as good as having a, you know, a, a teammate or, or a coach or somebody that's close to you that can push you, especially when you don't want to be pushed. Create regimen for right. you, yeah. And you have yeah. something to follow. Sometimes if you have to create your own regimen, you might take some shortcuts or punch out a little bit early to go do other things. Um, So I want to fast forward a little bit because um, when we first introduced Roland in the beginning, uh, we talked about 2004, which was Mm -hmm. a very, very special year for you. So 2000 came up short, right, right, from your expectations of what you had uh, for the Sydney Olympics, but you got a chance to compete. You got to feel the stardom of the Olympics and all the special treatment, which must have been really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And now we move to 2004, where the Olympic Games were being held in Athens, Greece. And that was beautiful. Yeah, birthplace of the modern day Olympics. Yeah, I remember that. I was actually just getting out of the Navy in 2004. So that summer was the last summer. And I remember watching the Olympics, you know, bits and pieces of it that year, living in San Diego, um, what was that like? What was the 2004 Olympics in Athens? That, I mean, that must have been iconic. That was amazing. I think you know, flying into Athens and, and knowing the history behind the Olympics and how it originated and to be able to go back to the birthplace of the modern day Olympics and, and compete there is really, you know, sort of, I mean, the greatest cherry on top, you know, I mean, the Olympics beforehand were in Sydney, but that's Sydney. You know, to go to the place where it all started, where it all started, there's something really special and cool about that. To be able, so to be able to go in, I mean, Greece was a bit of a mess uh, in terms of traffic, and the village was you know, an hour, probably 45 minutes to an hour away from any of the facilities. But they still did such an amazing job, and the experience itself was was truly incredible. But yeah, I mean, leading up to that had had so much good and so much bad. You know, in the World Championships in 2001, you know, I came and I won bronze in the 50 freestyle. So, you know, off the disappointment of the 2000 Olympics, came back and won, you know, won a bronze. Then going to Commonwealth Games in 2002, winning a gold, winning a silver. Uh, oh, so these were all, all things leading up to these are all things leading up to it. And so these are the like, world champion. Um, yeah, so we had the World Championships in 2001, the Commonwealth Games in 2002, then the World Championships in 2003. So I had an opportunity to go out and train in California at the University of Berkeley or University of California Berkeley in 2001 for the summer and had really felt like I'd done well. It was just a change of pace and things had, you know, I think, sort of you know, re-energized me in the way I was looking at things. I think I was very, very negative at that point in time. Spending the summer in Berkeley, the coach there sort of helped me look at things a different way. Nice. And it was, and then went back in 2003 and he wasn't there. Uh, he was there for periods of time, but he was, because he was such a good coach, he was off doing different things. And then we didn't, hadn't got the same coaching and hadn't had the same attention he heading into the World Championship in 2003 and went to the World Championships. So I was probably 10 pounds overweight, didn't swim well at all. Um, I kind of had to swim off as to be a reserve. You know, it hadn't done well. And then in the swim off, basically, to be a first reserve, I ended up going to the time where they would have placed me top three. So got back to the University of Arizona and I was very negative. I'd been awful at that point in time, just can't imagine that I'd been much fun to be around. And the head coach said, Roland, I love you. You're, you've had an amazing history, you're NCAA champion, and but this attitude of yours, mm-hmm. I, you, it either changes right now, or I say goodbye to you and you can go and do Find your own way. Yeah, exactly. And that's sort of, once again, somebody that keeps you accountable when you need it most. And that was the hardest thing for me to hear at that point in time. Somebody that I cared about and the head coach telling me, you either ship up, or I mean, you either shape up or you ship out. And that kind tough of really love, was. Good old tough love. It was tough love. Tough and, love is good. And I thought about it for 30 minutes and I had tears in my eyes and I'd been crying because it you know, hadn't been told out, you know, really told out like that in a very, very, very long time. 
you see glimpses of your own behavior and I think intrinsically you know that you're very negative or I at least did and you know he pointed that all out and then you know it but it's still tough to hear from somebody else and you know, 20 minutes later suit on back up deck I was like coach I'm gonna be here I want to do this uh, you know and it was really one at that point in time once again that I recommitted myself or refocused myself um, heading into 2004 there were periods, of course, where you slip up and you revisit your old patterns and everything, but I was so focused on what I wanted to accomplish. And you know, the coaches, I really think going into the 2004 Olympics, the idea was as a South African relay team, we had an opportunity to win gold because we were swimming really fast. Well, you know, there were three or four of us, you know, three that were swimming really, really well, like broken the African record, and then one of my teammates had broken it, and then I rebroke it, and it was just, there was this belief between us and the coaching staff that we could win an Olympic, well, we could win the gold medal at the Olympics. So I think that took pressure off my, me being an individual. So as in 2004, I went in with this belief that I was going to be an individual gold medalist and then going into 2004, it was like, man, I'm here as a part of a team. Mm. This is amazing. More powerful. More, way more powerful. And I think you can always give more effort when there are people around you. Well, at least I could. I the knew that. The dependent on you. And right. You're contributing as a team, as a group, as a unit, instead of just as an I. Right. Yeah, exactly. I like that. I can and, see that as well. Yeah, so it was cool. So I mean, going in, we had this level of, of expectation that, that we could win a, a gold medal. And we went in, and it was you know, the second day of the Olympics. And a lot of, a lot of the teams have the luxury of having six top athletes that they take. So they'll swim four people in the morning, they'll rest their top two guys and have them perform at night. To South Africa, we only had four guys. So we swam the four of us in the morning. We almost broke the world record. You know, and for me, I, I wanted to lead off because I just have a lot of speed going out. For me, I was like, I want to get my hand on the wall first. I want to get you guys as big a lead as possible and then you just go. Got it. You know, and the, if you watch the, the, the relay at night, you know, the same thing again. I just shot out of so out of started cannon. just you know, it, I just knew I wanted to go out as fast as I could with a level of relaxation and try to get to the wall first and give them as big a lead as possible and you know, that's exactly what happened so touched the wall um, you know swam broke a Commonwealth record almost broke the world record leading off and we just never lost the lead which was really really cool must feel amazing very special now when you start off uh, a race like that are you on a breath hold the entire time or are you at least coming up for air once before you hit that wall and do your uh, uh, what is it this your turn your, your flip turn and then way back you, you taking like at least one breath or are you like hold on a breath hold the entire time no, I was breathing every stroke so so it's just a short yeah sure you're, you're trying to maintain your it's all about body alignment so if, some people will breathe every other stroke. Other people will breathe every four or every six. For me, I could take my breath well enough without causing a disruption of momentum or you know, propulsion. And uh, the just to me, I was like, I need to get as much oxygen as possible because you go into you know, a huge oxygen debt towards the end of your race. And I knew if I got a lot of oxygen in the beginning, it's going to help me at the end. Uh, it was so just you, always the way I'd swim. So you try to take in as much oxygen as possible on every stroke. Right because that CO2 is built in fast. Yeah, it's one thing if you're doing a 50 freestyle, most people don't breathe in the 50 freestyle, but that's going 22 seconds or 21 seconds. They won't breathe, well, that's, I'm thinking down and back, because most pools are 25, but right. in Olympic style pool, it's just down. Yeah, for 50 meters. So you, you're holding breath the whole time. Yeah, which isn't, I mean, that's, that's, that's not hard, but to try and do that for 100, it's too much. To, you're not, you're not gonna survive <laughs> very well. Yeah, too much energy, just. That right, you, that exactly. You're losing. Um, so, in 2004 then, um, take us to um, you know, how it felt to earn that, that gold and the silver and the bronze and to, to, to really be a, at that level. There's probably a ton of attention. I mean, South Africa is a relatively small country mm -hmm. compared to Russia, the United States, China, right. all these other countries that you're competing against. Um, how did that feel? What was it like? Um, I think the beautiful thing was being able to share it with three other friends and, and three other teammates. Uh, we never won a relay medal before, let alone gold. So to be able to step up and win the first gold medal for South Africa at the Games, 
we don't we don't have the tradition in this country of, of the sponsorship and the, the funds being invested. So for a small country like South Africa to have four guys stepping up, three of who were trained at Arizona at that period of time was really it was really beautiful. It was as much a, a South African relay as it was an Arizona relay. Sure. All that four. I mean, one of the guys that hadn't started Arizona ended up transferring to Arizona. And nice. It was literally all four of us were there at a point in time. So it was, it was special. It was a huge accomplishment for us to be able to stand up there, arms around each other, and listen to this, the national anthem. There's, there's no more special moment that you can really have. You know, it may be gold on your own, but still, that's that's just me on my own. And then there's, you know, swimming is that. It's just you on your own at a period of time. But to be able to share it as... In the relay style. Right, exactly. There's something special about that and something that I love about what the United States collegiate system helps foster. It's a sense of team. It's important to be a team. Relays count more. They have more points. Mm -hmm. So you have to invest in the people around you. It's not about just you, just you, just you. It is to a degree in that you are the person that has to swim that lap, but you are contributing in the greater scheme of things to a team. You know, and that, that was important for us and something that I bit, you know, really bought into you know, at a later stage in, in my swimming career because I could see how important it was, that, that, camp, that camaraderie, how beautiful that was. You know, as opposed to, I win this on my own, I stand there, I'm happy with that. And it's like, that's great and all. But sharing that, now that's beautiful. You know, at least it was in my eyes at that point in time. And who was, uh, would you say, the guys to beat in 2004 on the world stage? Who was like, was Michael Phelps there yet? Or was he still Yeah, he was there. The U.S. were expected to win. And even, you know, you listen to some of the commentators on the U.S., the NBC feed, who are always biased. You know, they're two or three body lengths behind us. And they're like, Looking to the, look to the U.S. to charge now. It's like, yeah. you got... Five meters left, they're not going to charge kind of thing. But, you know, which is also cool with the American system because they back each other so much. You know, so it was really the U.S. was the premier team to beat and Australia who had won in 2000. So it was the Australians and the Americans you knew were going to be the top two teams. Or that was the idea of what most people believed. And here comes little old South Africa. Right, right, exactly. The great white sharks. Right. <laughs> so that was pretty special. And... And going from there and having performed as well as I did in the leading off that relay, you know, I'd swam the fastest time in the world in the 100 freestyle. So now all of a sudden I was like, oh man, I'm feeling really good. I, I, I think I can win this 100 freestyle. And, you know, and maybe not the 100 freestyle. I mean, I think I can do really well there, maybe win it. But the 50 freestyle, now that's my baby because of all the speed I have. And, you know, I ended up getting second in the 100 freestyle. The time that I went leading off the relay would have won me gold. Wow. And went back to the Olympic Village. It's like, you effing piece of shit. You useless. You piece of, you know, I was just. You were telling yourself that? Yeah, because for me, my <laughs> value had become winning gold. That's it. You know, it was extrinsic. And you just missed it. And I just missed it. And I saw my value tied up in that. It was like, if you don't want to, it's like, Ricky Bobby, you ain't first, you're last, kind of thing. And and that was the mentality. It's like, well I didn't win, so I'm useless. I'm a failure. I'm a piece of shit. I you know, all of these things. You know, and went walking around the village and I was looking at my silver medal, I was like, you don't deserve this, you know, wanting to throw it away. And it's like And you're still in Greece. Right. I mean and that's the thing. You're still enjoying and embracing right. the beauty of the the moment. Right. If you had spoken to me a month before, two weeks before and said, Would you be happy to walk away from these Olympics with a silver in the hundred freestyle? I'd be like, Heck yeah. But then you're there and you're wrapped up in the moment and you're so wrapped up in what I have to, have achieved and how I should be able to. It's like the should. I should it all you know, I was shooting all over myself. The old, thing. the old should word, yeah. Right. And then you know, so I was disappointed in that, but then had to refocus because I still had the 50 freestyle coming up. So I was like, okay, 50 freestyle's my baby. You know, and I, you know, I swam the fastest time in the morning, I swam the fastest time in the semifinals, and I was just like, this is mine. I know I've got this. And I think, you know, you can either be underprepared or, you know, or overfocused. And to me, I was over fo overly focused. I was just standing there. I was like, I'm going to kill this. And I was standing on the blocks and, you know, and I pulled so hard on the blocks, whereas my start was just my strength. And it was just, there was a level of relaxation and calm and, 
you know, I got off the blocks further than anybody else, I got off the blocks quicker than anybody else, and this I just wanted so badly. And I just pulled myself at more of a down angle than I normally would, and that cost me. Because you go too deep because before too you deep. get back to 100%. It. Wow, tiny, tiny little adjustments go a long way. I guess, yeah, yeah at that level, everyone, the times are just so close. And you have to try and make micro adjustments in that period of time. I, I knew immediately when I hit my start, I was like, this is not good. You knew it. You know, I, I, I knew that instead of being this far ahead of people, you know, I was probably going to break up equal with them and, you know, and touch the wall, got third, even more disappointed. You know, it's like, everybody's like, but you got gold, silver, and bronze. You got the full collection. I was like, F the full collection? How would I be an individual Olympic gold medalist? That's what you wanted. Yeah, and that to me was my value. You know, it's like, I'll be here in my country because I'm a gold medalist. I'll have lots of money because I am a gold medalist. Sponsorships will come through because I'm a gold medalist. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't an understanding that I have now about winning and achievement and where my value lie, lies at this point. So it was, it was tough. I mean, it was the, the highest of highs and almost the lowest of lows. You know, and coming off of that, it's just going back to South Africa and experiencing the life of there. It was like, oh, we're heroes. But there's still, as much as I felt this you know, the success of being part of this relay, I felt like an absolute failure because of the individual. Right, exactly. So it was, you know, there was so little, you know, there really wasn't a little balance, but to be able to look at the three medals, I'm, I still had a level of disappointment in the fact that I've never been an Olympic champion individually. But I can still like, look, and look at those medals and be like, each one of those, different experiences, different lessons, and each one of them was it is beautiful, which is, yeah, it took me a long time to see it that way. I'm glad that I eventually have, at least. So by this time now, you must be done with college, eventually you graduate, finish university, and then you're in that place of like, well, what do I do? What's my career? Well, I'm a swimmer. And how does one make a living? at that level. It's all about sponsorships and competitions and probably still world travel and competing in different events there mm -hmm. and uh, the sponsorship giving you that opportunity to train like an athlete versus going to get a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you balance that and, and how did things start to adjust for you after after university? Yeah, I mean my senior year was two thousand three so you know, 2004, in you know, my first year out of college, we won the Olympics and, you know, all of a sudden there were sponsorship opportunities that came in, money-making opportunities that came in. Backed that up in 2005 by winning two medals at the World Championships, or two gold medals at the World Championships, breaking two world records, uh, finishing second in the 100 freestyle, so had an, another amazing, so it was just another result backed up on another result. You know, finally won the gold in the 50 freestyle, finally won a gold in the 100, or 50 butterfly, and you know. When was this? 2005. 2005. Yeah, so more, you know, then all of a sudden it's like more sponsorship opportunities, more travel opportunities, more money making opportunities come in, and you know, it's not like professional football where you're getting Millions. 50, you know, 500,000 to 550 million. You know, for us, it was like, man, you get a, you get fifty thousand dollars a year. You know, you, you're, you're doing you're living life, kind of thing. Because that's like salary, right? And you get to swim, and you don't have to worry about, right? You know, working five days a week. Yeah, and then there's opportunities to win prize money, and then there are meets across the world where you can go and win money. So I mean, if you're making between fifty and ninety thousand dollars a year as a swimmer, you're just like, man, this yeah. is you're so what good. You love, you get to swim, you get to train, you get to practice. You get to compete, you get to travel the world because it's like huge international sport. And that must have been really fun. I'm sure you've seen a lot of really cool places, got to experience a lot of different cultures mm -hmm. uh, just through swimming, which is, which is amazing. Um, so after 2004, I mean, the next Olympics are 2008. I mean, you're just, you're just staying with it. Yeah. You went from 2000, 2004, 2008. And where was the 2008 Olympics? China, Beijing. Beijing, yeah. that's right. Yeah, so it was also, that was you know, that was going to be my last Olympics where I, I lived in Tucson. The goal was after 2008. I kept on having agents tell me, you, the only way you're going to earn money is to be in South Africa. You can't make money and earn a living living in, in the States. You have to be back, be back in South Africa. You have to be in the media's eye um, 
that's the way you're gonna make a living. So, swam the Olympics in 2008, and, you know, made the final in the 50 freestyle again, finished six, very, very disappointed. Took off a couple of weeks, and then we had a race in South Africa, broke the world record in the 50 freestyle. So I was like, okay, well, I know now I didn't rest up enough, so going to this, moving back to South Africa, um, lived in South Africa for about a year, didn't have the sponsorship opportunities coming on, um, irrespective of what the agents had promised. And that was one thing I learned, is that a lot of people are gonna promise you a lot of things, mm -hmm. and they're gonna under-deliver. You know, for me, it's like, I'd rather have somebody over-deliver and not make any promises. Sure, of course. You know, and I just, my swimming was going, getting worse and worse and worse. Went to the World Championships in 2009, and you know, I, I, sh I could have won a, the gold in the 50 butterfly. The time I went in the morning, uh, would have won me gold. Uh, time I went to the semifinals, I just tried to go too easy, save my energy, and because of that, I you know missed out. I was ninth, and wow. you know, Big time, difference. yeah, huge difference. So it wasn't. Uh, I mean, and, and it's just a couple hundreds of a second here or there. You know, so it's tough. And then I moved to south of France, lived in Marseille for six months. Nice. Just ended up getting too expensive without the sponsors. And uh, had made a decision there, went to the World Championships in 2010, didn't do well at all. Had a friend who accepted a head coaching position here at Phoenix. And I just said, hey man, if you get the head coaching position, I'll, I'll move back to Phoenix, I'll move to Phoenix and come train with you. And it was just really a good opportunity for me to get back to the States and something that I wanted to do. And so, yeah, it was just kept kept on racing over and over and over. It's a bit of sneeze. Oh, uh -oh. don't sneeze these days. <coughs> There's allergies. <laughs> <laughs> These days, if you sneeze. I know, I know, I know. I had a sneeze the other day at Costco, and uh, oh boy, I was doing <laughs> my very best to hold in that sneeze. The crazy time we live in now where you sneeze or you cough, and people are like, oh my god. No. Sneezing's not even part of the symptoms. Yeah. It's a, really? It's a weird thing. So, um, so swimming is just a big part of life now. It's a career. It's social it's part of your brotherhood I'm sure a lot of your friends are connected to it I mean I would love to hear about all of the amazing parties that must happen after the Olympics for these athletes but we typically don't get to hear about I might have to talk to Roland about that yeah, off camera hush hush yeah off camera <laughs> what that's like to be a gold medal swimmer in Greece uh, you know in your prime uh, that must have been a really good time and a fun time in life just to experience the city in that way. Very special. Very special. So let's talk a little bit about the mindset. You know, there's a lot of folks here that are listening to this podcast, the series Optimize Education. And we bring in a wide variety of, of different people who are just professionals in, in, in their area, you know. And, and today we, we sit here with Roland, a professional athlete, uh, an Olympic athlete who's dedicated his whole life to water. And it's funny because you are water too, as a cancer sign, yeah, right? Exactly. So uh, it's an interesting connection. I've dedicated most of my life to water, being in the Navy, search and rescue, uh, now a Wim Hof method instructor and founder of Optimize, where we do just a ton of hydrotherapy here. And I'm a water sign as well with Pisces, which is kind of funny uh, for people who are interested in those things. But I want to talk about like discipline and mindset. For the people at home who have these ideas of like getting healthy, and of course they're not going to try to compete at the level that you were at, where you wanted to be an Olympian, you wanted to be a gold medal winner. But for people who just want to start to learn how to build a bulletproof mindset mm. and how to create that just that that rock discipline that allows you to say no to things that appear to be fun and social and stick to you know what you think is actually best for your mind your body and your, your spirit you know, how did you override that for so many years because some people they have these runs these olympic runs where you know maybe you were training and, and, and working towards the olympics until you were 25 or 26 but you're still working on getting back into the Olympic Games. I mean, you've kept this mindset and you've kept this level mm -hmm. of discipline. Uh, what are some things that you can share with people and 
and something that you do uh, that's helped you to just stay in the, an excellent shape. I mean, Roland's in amazing shape. Um, and just from the, the couple of years that, that I know him, he's just got like an amazing discipline, which I believe uh, personally uh, that discipline is kind of like a key to happiness. You know, you say what you're going to do, you follow through, and you, and you do it, um, you, feel, you feel really good uh, about that. Because there's so many times in life where we, oh, I want to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. We all have friends and family that they're going to do 10 things, and then you check up with them a couple of months later, and they haven't even done, done one. You know? How many people stick to the New Year's resolutions, amongst other things? Exactly. Yeah. So what's been your secret? Um, what's been a I don't think trick, the hack, the One thing I've always learned mindset. is that, yeah, one thing I've learned is when people th ask you for a secret, they're looking for a shortcut. Of course. What is the secret to this? What is the secret to happiness? What's the secret to life? What's the secret to success? When you speak to any successful person, there's an understanding that there is no secret. You know, I think some of the things that helped me was, was planning. Beginning of each year, we'd sit down and we'd plan. Okay, well, you know, Olympics are August 13th to 19th, whatever it might be. We are planning. We have these phases. This will be the first phase from day one, and we we'll break it. Their macro cycles and their, you know, their micro cycles. Understanding that the goal is to continue to improve. I think when we look at, you know, if somebody's desires to lose weight, and you know they haven't, you know they want to lose 20 pounds, they immediately get this image of what they like, 20 pounds less. And like, but I'm not there. And the next morning, but I'm still not there. And, and you know, instead of you know, seeing that, you know, we sort of chunk down manageable pieces. Okay, well, I just want to lose two pounds this week. And I can do that by being committed to Small this, minutes. that, and the next thing. Small ones, 100%. So, you know, within the greater plan of things, and for the Olympics, it's a four-year cycle. You know, we want to be the best in the world in four years' time. So you have to break things down into smaller, more manageable cycles. Understand that you're only human. So there is a desire to you know, get better every single day. And I think that's part of the process is, is not being afraid to learn. It's being dedicated to learning. Well, you know, do I know everything there is to know on losing weight? No. What are the areas that I need to navigate to get better at that? For me, it was, well, what about my technique? What about my mindset? What about my diet? What about my mobility? What about my strength? What about all of these things? You know, it's, it's like taking a... Most people love chocolate chip cookies. I do. You know, right, me too. But when you look at a chocolate chip cookie recipe, there are lots of ingredients. If I were to just throw chocolate chip cookies down, or chocolate chips down here and be like, chocolate chip cookies, you laugh at me and you think that's absurd, but yet that's the same thing we do when we take on a new goal. You know, we don't look at all the avenues. We're like, okay, well, this is where I want to be, so that's where I need to be. And instead of, you know, like you say, those, those small wins, finding those teammates around you, and I think consciousness is contagious. And what I mean by that is when you surround yourself by people that are, have the same frame of mind, have the same desire, want to achieve a certain way of, of a certain thing. It's like if you want to lose 20 pounds, surround yourself with other people that want to lose weight as well because you can continue to drive each other. If you want to be the best in business, surround yourself with other people that are best Make in business. Moves, yeah. 100%. Because that's the way you learn through mentors, through people around you, through, you know, through your successes, through your failures. And to me, it's, it's like understanding that you know, there are obstacles that are going to come up. Maybe today you want to have six donuts. You know, maybe. <laughs> but that's all right. I mean, it's, I'm not going to tell you that's wrong. Because there were times in my training that I slipped up as well. You know, to, to believe that I did not ever go out and not party and wake up with a hangover, sure. You know, it wasn't I, the norm. It wasn't right, it that. wasn't the norm. You know, and, and so many people get so wrapped up in that one day where they're being human, and they have those six donuts, and they're like, "I'm yeah. going to punish myself." They beat themselves up. Yeah, we're our own worst. Uh, yeah, Absolutely, abuser. Absolutely. Sure. And it's like if if you had a little son, and he was wanting to play baseball, and he missed one catch, you'd go up to him and give him a hug. Hey, bud, I love you. I'm so proud of you. You know, that's, don't worry about it. We'll, we can practice some more. I guarantee you the next time that happens, you're gonna catch it. But if that's us, like me, winning an Olympic silver medal, you effing useless this, you piece of you know, shit this, 
It's like we are our own worst critic. Yeah. And especially if you have a critical mind too. Right. Yeah. Which I can relate to. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that does help to a degree in the world of sport in being human. That doesn't help at all. No. You know, so you have to have a level of not a level of compassion, but you have to be compassionate about yourself and for yourself. For yourself. Right. What is the idea of that? Compassion for yourself. Wow. I didn't even know that was something that we should be doing until maybe 10 years ago. Right. I mean, I had little to no compassion for myself, or you want to call it like self-love, you know. I was really hard on myself and really hard on others, too. So I was, uh, you know, of the military mindset. If you can't figure this out, let's put foot in back and keep pushing forward you know I was uh, intense yeah. you know, I had that kind of intensity from that rescue swimmer arrogance that we we built just like you were talking about the early level arrogance that started to come with swimming we had it as well um, I think there's a certain amount of programming that we deal with growing up that we experience most of it is from you know the ideology of I'm not enough and having to prove ourselves yes. and in spite of this and that and having these images of ourselves and it's just you know, it, it helped me for a while but I would always back myself into a corner with hate you know and, and feelings of inadequacy and feelings of not being worth and then try to perform outside of that and the more I grew the older I got like, it's not a sustainable model no. you know, and, and ultimately we have to look at sustainable models and that's part of where the planning comes in it's like what can I do that's sustainable I, I want to start riding a bike and I want to I want to cycle a hundred miles a hundred mile, mile whatever even say for instance doing the Ironman if I want to train the Ironman you got to start off small and you build up you build up your tolerance you build up your fitness you know, we can't have this belief I mean we can't have a belief that I want to lose 20 pounds but you also you know like you say beautifully you, 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 those small victories yeah. those small wins that's, that's what's important not starting your day off strong, right. right, with good habits. I mean, I do that. Uh, one of the small wins that I've incorporated in my life is I make my bed every day. And I hated making my bed. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in a household where my mom was relatively, well, strict in the sense that she liked things very orderly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that had that program was already built into me. And then the military, they make you, you know, make your bed sure. every day. Um, but when I got done with the military, I left all those habits. I said, I don't, no one's gonna tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, that mentality. And then I realized, as I started to build these uh, building blocks of daily discipline, that was like a very important piece of starting off the day off. Starting the day off with a small win and some sort of good, healthy routine, um, which has really helped me. Um, now, as a professional swimmer, I mean, I remember hearing just a lot of things about diet. I think the person that sticks out to me was Michael Phelps and how much 10,000 calories 10, 000, or something silly. 10,000 calorie diets. Um, I mean, at Rescue Swimmer School, we ate a lot. Uh, we had a Navy cafeteria right across the street from our school, and I probably ate more during those days than any time in my life from the morning PT, which was, you know, 10 mile runs on the beach, to calisthenics, push up sit ups, to lunch. I would typically take a nap and then we were back in the pool all afternoon, usually getting our butts beat. Mm -hmm. um, and by evening time we were starving and I just right. ate everything. It was you know sugary chocolate cakes, pastas, meats, whatever the cafeteria had, I would go up a few times and, and eat and I felt like I didn't put any weight on. So. What's been your diet? Um, I mean, I'm sure it's changed mm -hmm. dramatically um, from when you were 20 years old to you know, your age now. But yeah, I think did it get crazy like that where you were literally I, doing I so. 10,000 calorie diet? I don't know if it was ever 10,000. I, I mean, I've seen the YouTube show, or TV shows where they show you what 10,000 cal calories looks like. It's a lot. Of food. That's a lot of food, and. I mean, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I'm not sure. I mean, the media likes to exaggerate certain components because it sells. You know, I think obviously for you and, and for me during college, you know, you're moving nonstop all day. You're burning calories all day. Your metabolism is high all day. Yeah. For me in college, the same thing. Wake up at five, in the pool by six, training until eight, school.
school, going, sitting in classes, walking to uh, different classes, and, you know, until 12, 12.30, quick lunch, you know, to the pool, you know, from 2 o'clock to 4.30, uh, do some sort of rehab, prehab, uh, some sort of recovery afterwards, get home, dinner. So you're not, you're moving nonstop. I mean, for a lot of us college days, we're moving nonstop, and now we're living a far more sedentary lifestyle, and, yeah. you know, now it's... You know, my training would be now. It's obviously during quarantine. It's slightly different. But, you know, probably training four to five hours a day. But there are periods where I'm sedentary and, and not doing anything. So I can't be eating as much. I've tried keto. I've tried Atkins. I've tried this, that, and I've the next long. thing. I've tried everything because I've I've never been you know, afraid to try different things. I think that's part of why I was as good as I was in swimming because I, you know, I wasn't afraid to dream big. I wasn't afraid to say, okay, well, this is what I want to do. I want to break them all in this, in the, with that regard. And you know, it's been the same sort of process of thinking of like, well, what should my diet be? Should it be this? Well, let me try this. What do I have to lose? Okay, maybe I'm not as fast. Maybe I am. But I mean, I have I to risk it. Decision. Right, I have to risk it. Feel. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. It's like we're so afraid of risking things because we, we're scared. So for me, it was a level of like, well, what do I have to lose? I've already won on the biggest cycle and I've already lost on the biggest stage in the world. So let me try different things. So try paleo. Okay, it kind of works. And I still, well, what are the benefits? What did I experience? You know, instead of discounting it completely, which a lot of people do, it's like, okay, well, what did I notice? What was beneficial to me? Did I like the way this, that, and the next thing felt? Okay, well, these were the good things and these were the negative, negative things, okay? So it's been, yeah, really evolutionary thinking of how, how do I recover best? And how do I, you know, what do I need to take in a supplementary form? What do I need to take in in food? What do I have to do in terms of being at a center like this or using Normatex or any other recovery modalities to help me recover optimally? Recovery's kind of, he's probably came a long way. So, you know, we started off this conversation talking about the 2000 Olympics and uh, well, even before that, and now we're up to present day where recovery is it's kind of everywhere. It's uh, gained in popularity. Um, Roland and I met uh, early on and I had recently become a Wim Hof Method instructor. And uh, right away, you know, one of the, the, the first times us kind of hanging out, we were doing breath work exercises together in my backyard, doing ice baths. And um, when we first opened up the center here in Phoenix, where we have cold plunge, warm water, hydrotherapy, infrared saunas, all the compression units, we have uh, the Juve red light therapy. Uh, Roland was using the equipment uh, right away, part of the, the optimized crew, and uh, putting a lot of emphasis in recovery. Um, but that wasn't the way things were 10 years, even 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, right. you know. Um, so what was, what was recovery like then and what has <laughs> recovery done for you today and using these, these modalities like cold water and sauna and going from sauna to cold mm -hmm. water and vice versa, this kind of circulation training, how has that assisted you in your your older years of swimming. I mean, I think it's like you don't know what you don't know. You know, it's, I wonder with all these different modalities. You know, if back in 2000, 2004, had I been using these or approached things differently, could I have been better? Sure. You know, so but hindsight's always 2020. Of course. You know, and I think very very thankful that we're in this time and this age now where. We're focusing on health. We're focusing on performance as much as we are. You know, companies are coming out left, right, and center with new products on how to sleep better, how to yeah. recover better, how to optimize the muscles. Uh, you know, I'm getting a blood flow restriction unit on Saturday. I'm going to be starting to implement that. It's just, I think when we're kids, we have so much energy. We don't have to think about recovery yeah. because we sleep like champions. Yeah. We eat like champions, and we can. And that really was the way I was in, in college for the most part for me. And then post that, you start, you know, everybody knows, well, most people, if you're over the age of 20, you know, you start waking up with a little pain and ache and you know what muscle stiffness feels like. And I was like, well, I want to be better at being human. You know, I think being a specialist athlete 
is great because you can be a specialist. But the amount of movements I had to put in the swimming pool and just repetitiveness of that, it took me away from being a human in a sense that I lost the ability to maybe deep squat or be as mobile and flexible as I was. You know, a guy like Ido Portal speaks you know, volumes of how specialization is, is a blessing, but it's also such a curse to, to be a specialist. And I think now for us, you know, to be able to come into a center like this, and, you know, there are different centers for different needs. You know, there are other centers in Phoenix that cater to a specific group of people maybe runners or maybe cyclists and then there's a sense of like optimize that caters for well-being you know there's a spiritual component there's a well-being component there's a recovery component so to me that was something that resonated immediately as I've I've undertook you know wellness I mean I've been, it's been a huge part of my life for, for so so sports long. rehab kind of right exactly. mentality, yeah. and to me you know it's like part of that puzzle part of that pie or, or that recipe. It's the spiritual component as well. You know, and, and me, time for me, and that's part of being one of the, the biggest things for me is, is meditation and growth and being still. You know, being able to come into a place like this and, you know, have the friendly faces and the music playing and, you know, just whether somebody's on the drums or, yeah. you know, whatever it might be, you know, you can come in here and relax and, and just focus on you and focus on your needs, your growth. You know, instead of, and that's that was a beautiful thing to me, is because it was always about, you know, destroying my body. You know, I needed and, and I was okay with that. Like a machine. Right. I was okay with that. To me I wanted to experience pain. There's still parts of me that I, I want to push myself as much as I can to the point where I think I'm going to die because that's where that's where you get better in many ways. But also being able to be like, man, I need to be gentle with myself. Mm -hmm to be able to come in here and not everybody likes hopping in the ice you know that's true but there's something beautiful about that being able to hop in and surrender yeah I mean, if I'm on an assault bike or lifting heavy weights or in a, in a really tough swim there are points in there where you want to give up and there are points where you want to surrender you know but it's just beyond that where the bliss is the yeah. beauty and you know when you touch the wall and it's, in the, it's the best time or all of a sudden you your first experience in the ice tub was, you know, 30 seconds. You just couldn't go. And then the next time it's 40. And then it's two minutes. Two minutes, no problem. You know, your previous best, you know, and, and now pales in comparison to what you're capable of. And it's such a great metaphor for life is because, the, you know, whatever, whoever we are, whatever experience are, they're going to be times of stress. Can we breathe through that? Can we use the breath to control ourselves and our emotions? Can we stay centered? You know, when things get tough in the, in the sauna and it's getting really, really hot. Sometimes it's necessary. You know as well as I do. Sometimes it's necessary. Okay, today I know I don't need to push myself. Same thing in the swimming pool or in the gym, wherever it might be. I know today I, I don't it's need to push, push myself. Push myself. Yes. Exactly. But today I say, I, this feels good. Or I know when to push myself. Well, now I need to breathe through it. Because there are going to be periods in our life where anxiety hits us, depression hits us. How do we handle that? You know, are there people that we can get involved? Can we open up? And I think that's been probably been one of the biggest lessons of the last few years. Is you know, I was very, very singular in, in the sense that it was me, 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 me. Very, very selfish in my time. Very, very selfish in my thinking. I don't like sharing. I mean, this is tough for me as it is, just sharing. And but I've gotten better at it because it's. There are other people out there that are experiencing the exact same thing you are. Maybe they're not Olympic swimmers, but maybe they're in a business that's failing and they don't know how to cope. Maybe they're in a relationship that's, that's all, not great. All translates. Yeah. But then Olympics is just a metaphor for everything else, a level of success. You know, it's... So and that's trying right. to reach. Right. 100%. Level of performance, a place to perform. Right. Yeah. Exactly right. Playing stage. <laughs> right. So it's like now, with all these tools, can we find a sense of balance? Can we find a sense of homeostasis? And that to me is the critical component because for the longest time I was just killing myself here and you know, me and homeostasis and balance was down here. And you, you get injured, you get depressed, you struggle from anxiety. And you know, like how can I find that level of balance again? It's, it's one thing I always appreciated about, uh, about you, Roland, is that 
Um, you know, you meet a guy like Roland, and you know, right away you see his accolades, right? You know, he's an Olympian swimmer. You know, a very quick Google search, and you know, he's all over the place from news articles to he's got his own Wikipedia and uh, all of his accomplishments. And you know, you get a bit starstruck, right? Wow, this guy's really, you know, done a lot, a lot of special things on the world stage, and it's pretty amazing to be able to compete at that level. But my experience with you has just been like so like you've been so humble for for as long as I know you uh, your desire to want to know yourself you know um, we don't even talk about performance and athleticism I don't think ever I mean we talk about recovery of course because you know we're here at optimize and we're doing that kind of work but we don't talk about diets we don't talk about performance we don't even talk about your competitive days in the Olympics. Uh, most of our conversations really revolve around being a better person, inner work, facing our demons. Uh, this is the most we've ever spoken about. Yeah, I mean, I've learned so much today just about his history and how he got to uh, you know being a professional athlete and, and, and everything in between. But uh, really, most of the time has been spent uh, talking about inner work and being really the best versions of ourselves and, and con contribution and self-love and, and all those other topics that uh, you typically wouldn't think people talk about. So I've always appreciated that you have that because you know, I've been in the presence of other uh, athletes, uh, of course, you know, working in this, in this space of recovery, uh, baseball players and football players, and um, you know, sometimes it's just very mechanical, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it's all about the sport, it's all about you know, the physical, the body, and he's trying to dabble in the spiritual and inner work and can become like really uncomfortable or woo-woo or fuzzy for people, but uh, from the very beginning, um, we've been able to have that, uh, that relationship and that partnership, which is something I really appreciate and we can learn from. A lot of people don't like to go deep. No, you know that. <laughs> surface people, level, right? Yeah. A lot of people Wear don't like to see what's deep down. And I think you know, that's where the growth lies. Yeah, that's real maturity too. Right. You can spend so much time killing yourself and being fit, but if it's bred from a level of inadequacy, no amount of performance, no amount of getting fit is going to solve your problem yeah. of inadequacy. Jason, for forever. me, that that was it. Everything was bred from a level of inadequacy and. It's like, well, where does that lie? <laughs> it's like, within me. And you know, I think that's an important lesson or one that most people don't understand or are surprised to hear. It's like, but you're an Olympic gold medalist. Yeah, you, sh you should be happy. You should be. But look at Michael Phelps. Depressed, you know, suicidal. Now that he's a father with two, you know, two or three beautiful kids, he's the happiest he's ever been because he doesn't have the pressure of having to be the best at anything. There's a level of comfort in himself now that's just bred with, you know, he's just content. And many people see you as a, an Olympian or a world record holder and think you have tons of cash. Well, it's not really true. But then you look at these football players, how many of them are abusive to their wives? How many of them are, you know, alcoholics? How many of them are really amazing people, though? I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't, but there are just as many people that are so unhappy with who they are and their lives and their experiences and we don't see that we see yeah. surface level exactly like you say you see somebody winning an olympic gold medal you see somebody winning the super bowl we make our own assumptions about it yeah it doesn't matter who you are it's like we look at movie stars rock stars how many actors actresses musicians have committed suicide yeah but so i mean that's the thing. Money is not the answer. That's it's not sure. always the answer. It's more yeah. material love right. in general. I chase that. Yeah. It's amazing. Like As human beings, like we go through so many different types of experiences just to know ourselves. I mean, from two different people, um, born close in age, um, different parts of the world, different culture, uh, different upbringing, and going through such a different path, but all really for the same reason. It's like knowing ourselves through these experiences that we created and manifested. 
whether it be early in your days and getting into professional swimming or early in my days of having to compete in the Navy and size myself up on whether or not I felt that I was good enough, uh, capable enough, fearless enough, all those these uh, egoic things that I had to overcome or thought I had to overcome. Yeah. Glad I overcame in many ways, helped me today. So yeah, it's just an interesting game we're playing here in the game of life. So, so what's um, what's next for for Roland Schuman? Schuman. I say it. We gotta say it right. Schuman. Schuman. Yeah. Schuman. Very fast. I've. I mean, I've been called Schuman, Schuman, Schoman, Showman. I always want to go to Schuman. Schuman just when I read it, you know, with yeah, that's my, kind of the way it comes across. Yeah. Schuman. So I just. Yeah. You accept I mean, it as long as it's not hey you. With a name like Roviello, <laughs> it's been pretty butchered over the years. Right. So right. A lot of ravioli in there. Yeah, I think what's next, uh, you know, this this last 2019 was an incredibly tough year with a lot of lessons learned and I think, you know, it really drove me to understand you know, where my self-worth was and I think I identified as a swimmer for the longest period of time and that I think we, we all struggled with that, identifying with a certain area of our life and, you know, sort of had to go through a very, very big ego death and... You know, I, the goal is, you know, I want to swim at the 2021 Olympics. You know, I want to... Which was supposed to be 2020. Which was supposed to be 2020. And I'm, they've now, what, postponed? Yeah. To postponed what, one, until one, one whole year? One full year. And, and I think... And it's supposed to be in... In Tokyo. In Tokyo. Yeah, I, I mean, Tokyo is going to be phenomenal and technologically advanced. I think it's going to be a, a fantastic game. But I think my motivations for doing that are... are so many people are in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s and they've given up on their dreams because they think they're too old. And, and How I old are you now? 39. 39 years old. Yeah, so there's a big part of me that wants to continue to, sh you know, to show other people that it's never too late. I like that. You, know, you can be, you know, it doesn't have to be your, tw you know, your best years are until you're 25 and then you graduate from college and then if you haven't achieved what you want to achieve, it's, it's over. It's like now I've, I've started learning guitar and it's, it's humbling, you know, your fingers are just awkward and, but I want to, you know, I'd like to show, you know, or help other people see by being candid in conversations like this and being open about my experience and my struggles that, you know, if you desire to achieve something, it's never too late. And if you have the right plans in place, if you dream big, you know, whatever it is, you can continue to, you know, you can achieve that. Whatever it might be, you know. So that that's huge for me, and I think post that is, you know, I'd love to. And I, I think service is definitely something that's that resonates with me. Being able to help others, you know, whether that is individuals or companies, and I think I think a lot of it happens at the at the very very top levels. I think my experience as an Olympic swimmer and, and being on the world's biggest stage has given me a, a sort of a unique perspective on things and I'd like to help other people that are in the same position whether it's the Olympics or top businessmen or and it doesn't have to be limited to that no but I think so those Olympians those top athletes those top business businessmen have some of the biggest insecurities and you know lack of balance ultimately than than we could have they could have so it's about helping other people find balance again helping other people you know through my experiences through you know, coaching them through various scenarios or whatever it might be. Ultimately, I think a level of coaching. Being able to compete under stress. Right. Be able to be sound and, you know, under stress. Well, and you've been able to demonstrate that at a very high level. You know, most people, they think about, you know, physical performance. And, of course, they want to think of whether you trained enough, whether you're in enough shape, good enough shape, whether your body's prepared, whether your diet's right. But... The number one factor in, in all of it is that mindset. Right. How is your mind, you know, right. your self-talk, you know, how you talk to yourself um, is most important. And that can translate into you know, the things that you've been able to demonstrate at a high level can be translated to, to really any industry, anywhere. Right. And I look forward to uh, partnering with Roland in the future. Uh, we have lots of goals here at Optimize to do some really, really cool powerful retreats um, with, you know, uh, lots of education, 
and also uh, water, right? Just mm -hmm. water retreats from um, you know, cold water therapy, warm water therapy, and we've even been approached to do some other things surrounding so free diving and all kinds of stuff. So I look forward to, to connecting with you in the future and, and, and uh, learning from you as well and uh, partnering with you to do these types of things. So I think uh, the sky yeah, is I'm excited too. So I think the ultimate is once we get over this right pandemic sooner than later. Yes, so I think one thing I've learned that's important is I talk about the recipe and the puzzle. It's can we look at things holistically? And and I think we can all incorporate you know more of that into our daily lives. And I I think what a lot of people are learning now during this is to find those times of silence to be able to go inward to you know obviously there are a lot of people that are just playing video games and there's nothing wrong with it but there are other people that are dedicating this to reading more yeah. to interacting more with their family changing habits exactly changing habits so it's I, I think this is going to bring out the best in us in some of us and it's going to bring out the worst in some of us and that in and of itself is a beautiful thing so I'm looking forward to it. Being able to give people people hugs again and not have to worry, being able to sneeze and cough without people immediately getting scared and putting distance uh, between well, you and them. Yeah, I hope that goes away fast because you know it's really grim if you look into a future where that becomes normal. Um, I know it's not going to be normal from my perspective. I won't continue to live like that. Um, but I hope uh, everyone enjoyed this today. I know I did. Uh, getting to know Roland, a good friend of mine, even better. Uh, I think it's always powerful to take off your mask. Uh, I learned at a later age in life that vulnerability is power. Um, I spent many years uh, wearing a mask, showing people what I wanted them to see. And um, at this point in my life, you know, just being able to truly express who you are, uh, the good things, the bad things, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, and just letting people know who you are is just, just feels great and uh, just an amazing way to, to live. So I'm happy to, to share this uh, time with you, Roland. Thank you so much for being here, uh, for supporting Optimize, for being one of our ambassadors, just for really promoting the type of work that we do here. I uh, really appreciate you. So for uh, everyone else, I'm gonna put uh, Roland's uh, information um, at the bottom of this video so that you can connect with him on Instagram and Facebook and follow him, follow his journey. Um, we'll be back. I'm sure we'll do uh, another podcast. We'll do some training together, I'm sure, in the future. And um, I'll just give some last words or anything that you want to share or finish with or um, to you. Yeah, I think we're hearing it a lot. We're all in this together. And I know they're speaking about, you know, the pandemic and everything, but in the greatest scheme of things, you spoke about it so beautifully. We can be an Olympian or not an Olympian, and we're going through this journey of life together, this game of life together, and trying to figure this all out. And I'm no different from you in that sense or anybody else. I'm, I have my own insecurities and my own guards up, and I don't want to be vulnerable. And you know, it's trying to come to the understanding of where that's from. And I think you, you said so beautifully about being vulnerable. Vulnerability is power. Mm -hmm. It was the same thing, came from a society where you, you don't cry, you don't show you're vulnerable. That's, that's for pussies, yeah. you know, is what, what we heard a lot of times. And, you know, to be authentically you, whether that is angry, sad, happy, that is pure power. Oh, freedom too. I'm 100% freedom. So much freedom. And, and ultimately, you know, what anybody else thinks about us is none of our business. Mm, like They're going to think it no matter what. You can be yeah. the best athlete in the world. You're going to have people that respect you. Do-gooder. Yeah. And you, there are going to be people that hate you. Yeah. And ultimately, it's just what their own opinion and their beliefs are of you. So a lot of time we get stuck on that. So stop getting... I can't say stop. <laughs> uh, if you can, you know, take anything from me is I've tried to limit the amount of what I believe somebody's influences on me. You know, how that affects me and it's very very like you say freeing empowering um, people are going to think what they want to think of you it doesn't matter what walk of life they're in you're from and ultimately whether it's me or the person judging you we're all going through some form of battle and we don't always know what that is like so I'm going through battles every single day and 
you know, surrounding myself with friends and beautiful people to to help me get through that. Because life's better when you're spent with you know, people you truly care about. That's true. I agree. We'll end on that. Thank you all for uh, spending time and listening to our conversation today. And we would love to have you follow along uh, by hitting the subscribe button and staying with us. Every couple of weeks we've been putting up new videos, um, interviewing uh, different folks um, throughout. We have um, Khaled Jardi, we just met with last week in the Syrian refugee camps. Uh, you can check out that video. I uh, highly recommend check out Khaled and his video. We have uh, Dr. Diane Grice next week. We'll be interviewing her, uh, talking about uh, circulation, hydrotherapy, sauna, and also uh, the current state with COVID-19. And uh, we also talked uh, about 5G facts, uh, facts and fiction with uh, David Schumann, which yeah, no uh, relation, no <laughs> relation, but same exact last name, uh, Dutch, yeah, right? Dutch German, Dutch German, German background, yeah. and. Um, so yeah, subscribe and stay with us and we really appreciate you. Thank you for supporting this channel and we're out. And you guys are open though. So if, yes. if you don't know. Yes, we are open right now uh, for our members on a temporary uh, by appointment only basis. And we are going to uh, continue to maintain that by uh, following all the, the state regulations as well and social distancing. We have a very limited amount of people in, in the center right now. And we're doing all of our uh, classes virtually so that we can do uh, breath work, meditation, um, and also talks like this um, all virtually. So we're you know, improving every day. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Roland. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you, man. Love you. And love you, too. See you guys.